I want to, I'm going to read the whole backstory of that night, which is found in the book of John. And, uh, and uh, I, I read it over and over this week. Of course, it has to do with communion, of course, and there's some points we're going to make along the way. And we're going to worship. We're going to worship. Amen. What we just did was called praising. When you praise the Lord in a, in a band, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to make mistakes. Forget how to do something. Go ahead and laugh, people. Like, come on, give me a smile. There it is. I'm bored. Give me a smile, brother. You want to come sing with us? No. You want a, you want a tambourine? No. All right. When we come to our time of worship, though, we're going to just going to kind of wander down and uh, bring down the lights and we're going to worship God. Amen. We'll do that. We'll do that in a few minutes. We've got a couple more songs. Today's going to be more of a musical day, actually, than a, than a sermon day. I did write a sermon, by the way. But the Lord told me to worship Him today. Amen. I saw a, a video last night from John Revere. Who has heard of John Revere? John Revere. He wrote us. He wrote an allegory called Affable. A f f a b l e. Affable. Uh, it's 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 amazing. You know what an allegory is? It's a fictional story with the real truth behind it. It's kind of like a parable. So uh, John Bevere was on uh, oh, I forget the name of the program. Sid Roth. Something like that. Anyway, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. John Bevere was talking about uh, he was talking about the fact that. He's been doing ministry for about 40 years, and he's seen the reverence, the reverence to Almighty God has just gone on out the window. And here we are, a little church, 20 people, and well, there's 40 of us now, I guess. We, there's, we have our traditional service, and our contemporary. And here we are, we're, we're reverencing God. I, I don't think we have to make up for all the folks that aren't, but we're going to reverence God this morning. Amen. Can I, are you with me now? Raise your hand. It's an amen. Amen. All right. Amen.
trust in you, Jesus. Thank you, Sherry and Sherry and Little Miss Raspberry. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to change my guitar. And let's go our hearts to worship. I'm going to ask the Chip might kind of bring us into a time of worship with the word of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Chip. Back there, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Father, we're so grateful. Amen. Father, I know that your day coming soon, and you're going to be an opportunity. Lord, I can only imagine the perception of the influence of the Lord Jesus. We walk through this And Lord, we're going to kneel and we're going to say, You give our lives in charge. You give our lives in charge. Lord, I'd like you to come. Lord, just let the Holy Spirit. Father, that we can put away the things of our leading lives, Father, and just focus on you. So the peace that you can bring into our hearts and our lives. Jesus, I know you love me. You love me, Father. You love everyone on this earth. Thank you. 
Take the offering now. I can't see y'all. I got light in my face, but I know there's people out there. Uh, Chad, would you pray for offering, please? Heavenly Father, we ask today that you bless this offering. Use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. We know that you have everything that we do for your glory. We thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for the blessing that you have given us. And we thank you for your Well, hello on the camera. <laughs> My name is Pastor Bill, and you have found us here at Valley Ministry Center in Vienna, West Virginia. Oh, the uh, pillar lights, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, these, these lights right there above Michelle's head. Yeah. We're here in Vienna, West Virginia. Again, we're called Valley Ministry Center. You haven't you haven't heard us that name because it's a new name. It's a uh, it's a new it's a new day here up on the hill at the end of 17th Avenue in Vienna, West Virginia. And uh, many years ago, many many years ago, there there was a. There was a church here called Cornerstone Gospel Church. It went on for 25, 30 years, and it began to, it began to, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, I can't find a word. I'm going to say that it changed. I'm going to say that it changed, and 
it wasn't long and, and a new church started up here um, called Thrive Worship Center. And many of y'all have heard of us in the, uh, in the Mid-Ohio Valley. And, and um, as a matter of fact, many people think that Thrive Worship Center is a uh, alcohol and drug rehabilitation center. <laughs> and you know what? I would say it is a recovery center. We're all recovering from something. Can I get an amen? If you don't think you're recovering from something, then you need to check in with the Lord because you have a problem with fibbing. <laughs> amen. <laughs> right. No, we're not a we're not an alcohol drug recovery center. We're, we we were named Thrive because we believe that the Lord wants us to thrive in our life. And so a couple of months ago, maybe, I don't know, four or five months ago, I began praying about the sanctuary next door. There were many things that we had thought about. I began praying and I, I said, Father God, it would be so wonderful for that sanctuary to be alive again with with beautiful music and the grand piano and and, uh, and and preaching and I asked the Lord to bring a pastor that would lead that that service and he did we didn't advertise we didn't look for resumes the Lord did and uh, on Easter Sunday, we here at Thrive Worship Center, along with the new pastor, Pastor Chad Emrick, we got together as a group. We renamed the church Valley Ministry Center. And now we have Cornerstone Traditional Service. We gave it that name because to to honor those that for all those years had come and, and been part of building that that great ministry. Uh, the, uh, uh, Solomon writes that in everything in life there's a season. It was time for a new season. And um, so we formed Valley Ministry Center and at 9.30 in the morning we have our traditional service. I invite you to that. And at 10.30 we come into the fellowship hall, there's donuts and coffee, and, and we chit-chat for a while, and then somewhere about quarter to 12, 11, we start our contemporary service, which you just heard the music to, amen? And so I just kind of wanted to give you that, that wonderful story. I, I think it's amazing what God is doing here. You know, friends, um, Starting a, a church is very unusual in this day and age in terms of it thriving. You may not know this, but 6,000 churches a year in the United States of America close down. 2,000 start up. 6,000 close down. Yeah, there's been reports out recently in the news. You've probably seen them. Mainstream media, as a matter of fact, which is kind of interesting. There's been reports out in the news that the 130 million Generation Z, the Millennials, Generation X, and now the teenagers coming up under Generation Question Mark. I don't know what calling them, only about 10% of them are actively serving God. They, they belong to a church. They will look you in the face and say, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. I heard an old preacher recently, and, and he said he when he asked somebody questions about their faith, he, they say, well, I'm saved. And he says, I didn't ask if you're saved. I asked if Christ is in you. Amen. And here at Valley Ministry Center, in both of our services, we will continue to tell
tell you about what the Bible says. We, 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 can, we can do support groups. We plan to, as a matter of fact, pretty soon, actually. And on Friday night, we have a huge support group here. We'll give you all kinds of stuff about how to live life. But on Sunday morning, we're going to read the Bible. Because the Bible tells us how to live life, doesn't it? How about it, crowd? Can I get an amen? All righty. Hallelujah. Michelle, may I please have a walk? So, you turned it to the book of John, didn't you? Turn over to the book of Luke first, please. Luke chapter 22. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 22. Two of the Gospels and first in the book of 1 Corinthians, or the, the first letter to the Corinthians, maybe the second letter, it's, it's either the first or the second, you can read about the, the, the Last Supper. And they call it the Last Supper, but it's really the First Communion. Right? Yeah. And I, I'm going to read the, this passage about... The Lord's table, the Lord's supper. So Luke 22, starting in verse 7. Amen. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Of course, most of us in the room, we know that this is Old Testament language. If you're watching by camera today and you're not familiar with that, if you look it up, you can read about that in the book of Exodus. The, the Passover lamb, you remember in the movie with the Ten Commandments when, when Moses told them to put blood on the doorpost and, and this was going to keep the angel of death, or the, not angel, but I guess fallen angel of death, whatever, from coming by their house. The, the last plague that happened in Israel, I mean in, uh, in Egypt, you remember that? And it took the firstborn, um, of which Pharaoh called that plague upon himself. Moses did not call that plague upon him. Pharaoh did. As a matter of fact, Moses told him, you know what? You shouldn't have said that. Bad news. Because I can't reverse it. You know, um, Without trying, when I don't have a written sermon in front of me, I do have a tendency to to kind of make points that are, you know, a little sideways points. Let me just say something to you: Don't mess with God. Do yourself a favor. Don't don't tease God. Not a good idea. You know, I mean, God is is patient and long suffering. I mean, He waited 400 years before He destroyed the Canaanites, but. You know, 400 years is a long time, but I, I would say in this life, we got 80 years, so 85 maybe, 90 at best, huh? You don't, you don't want to mess around with God. Pharaoh messed around with God. And the Passover was instituted, the Passover was when they, they uh, um, uh, I believe they broiled the lamb, if I'm not mistaken, um, and they ate every part of it. Amen. They had their neighbors come share. But what it was was a symbol of the death, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, or the, Jesus says, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. Now, this is the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. There are thousands of people in Jerusalem. It's a big deal. Probably the biggest festival. There's many festivals, but probably the biggest one. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you. So the person that owned the house knew Jesus. He was referred to as the teacher. He, he, will, he says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Okay, and he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there. 
So the disciples did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And it says, and they went out and they found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. Jesus is preparing us. He says, go find the room. Get it ready. Get things prepared. Amen? Because we know that one day, in the twinkling of an eye, that we are going to be changed. Mortal into immortal. In the twinkling of an eye. Amen? Uh, amen. And so in verse 14 it says that when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now understand that most of them still didn't understand that, that Jesus was about to be crucified. And before that, he, he went through terrible suffering as he was as he was beat and tortured and, and ridiculed and mocked. They didn't quite understand it yet. He says, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. A day is coming. A day is coming. Tomorrow, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, we don't know. We have no idea. There's some people that are speculating pretty, pretty heavily about the day when we will be gathered together and be with the Lord. Jesus is waiting for that. And we're going to have something called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. You can read about it in uh, maybe about Revelation chapter 20 or somewhere in there. The Marriage Supper of the Lamb. It's, it's an amazing thing. You have that to look forward to. Amen. As a matter of fact, let me say that you have the rest of your life to look forward to. Life is good, is it not? I know it's raining a little bit outside, and you know, and there's the, the dog's not feeling well, and I, I get that. I right? speaking to the camera. I understand there's some issues in life, but you know what? Life is good. We're okay. We're not being hit by hypersonic missiles that are being lobbed over across the border from. From a uh, from an enemy, amen. Life is good, amen. All right, and so it says here that 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 um, in verse seventeen, and he says, and I took a cup, or he took a cup. John or Luke is writing this. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, "Now this is Jesus speaking again. If you're not red letter in your Bible, take this and divide it among yourselves." For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. Jesus takes the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them. And it wasn't just the, the 12 apostles in the room, the disciples who were about to be graduate to be apostles. There was other people in this room. So they're passing around the bread. And Jesus says, for the first time in the history of the world, he says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now imagine being one of the disciples in the room. They're like, what in heaven's name is he talking about? You know, Jesus had a way of, of, I guess, confusing people. He would speak in parables. You say, Pastor Bill, why did he do that? Because Jesus knew who would come back and ask a very important question. What in the world are you talking about, Jesus? We don't get it. Those are the people that Jesus was looking for. Jesus knew that most of the crowds, there was a hundred people in the crowd, he would share a parable, and, 
after the, they ate the fish and so forth and their belly was full, off they'd go. Ah, but there'd be eight or ten or twelve or fifteen people that would come back and say, Jesus, what did that mean? Everybody pat yourself on the back. You are those people. Did you know that? I mean, isn't that why you come to church? Because you want to know more? I hope you don't come here to church just to make friends and, and network and eat donuts. <laughs> There's not enough of us to network. So. Yeah. We want to know. Jesus, what do you mean? What did you mean? You just said to eat your body? That's, you can't do that. Jesus explains later on. We'll come back to that. In verse 20, and then Jesus says, and likewise, the cup, after they had eaten the bread. And he says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. What does this mean? A new covenant. What's a covenant? A covenant is a deal that God makes with us. It's something that is between us, between us and God. There are unconditional covenants, and there are conditional covenants. Amen? It's like God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Bless them. That was an unconditional covenant. God might say to someone else in the scripture, if you do this, I will do that. Right? A conditional covenant. In other words, we're part of that process. But if we do not do our part, God doesn't have to do his part. This that he, that he, that he wrote here, or that he spoke here, was an unconditional covenant because the blood of Christ as we hear about we sing about and we learn about is that which is efficacious for the complete propitiation and expiation the removal of the wrath of God the removal of of the sin debt of mankind. If you're watching my camera this morning and you're saying, Bill, you lost me, hang around. I, 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 we'll catch up here in just a second. Amen. I'm going to explain this a little more to those at the end as I give a final gospel presentation for salvation. Now I'd like you to turn over now to John 13, where you were before. We're going to move through three chapters of the book of John really quickly. There's some things I want to share with you. Amen. John chapter 13. So what we just covered is simply the first communion. The bread wine, the body, the blood of Jesus. But there was a whole lot that happened that night, y'all. They didn't just go up there and, and eat the Passover meal, and then Jesus went off to Gethsemane. There was a tremendous amount of information that Jesus gave these guys in the last, the last couple of hours. I mean, we don't know what time it was when Jesus was in the garden praying. You can read the prayer of Jesus in the 17th chapter of John. But Jesus covered a lot. The first thing Jesus did, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase most of this. The first thing Jesus did is he washed their feet. Have you ever had your feet washed in a service? I almost did it today. 
I was going to put towels right here. But the Lord said no. But we're going to do a combined communion service, traditional and contemporary, uh, in the next month or two. And we may have that be part of the service. Y'all, God washed these guys' feet. He put a towel around him, his waist. He took off his outer coat. He put a towel around his He got on his knees. You know, it, I mean, it's just, it's astounding. Peter, I love Peter. Peter says, Lord, you're not washing my feet. Jesus said, what I am doing, you don't understand. And there may be some here this morning, or definitely maybe somebody watching by the camera. Why in the world would God get on his knees and wash someone's feet? Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. In other words, this isn't going to work out. Simon Peter said, okay, Lord, great. Not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> Jesus answered him. He says, you know what? The one who has bathed does not need to wash, Peter. Why did he say that? Peter was clean. He'd been with Jesus three years. He had bathed his heart had been dunked in the in the water and cleansed. Peter was a follower of Jesus, but his feet were still dirty. Why were his feet dirty? Because they wore sandals. Why are our feet dirty? What what is what are your feet? Besides these things with five toes on the end. What are your feet? Our flesh. Yeah. It's our flesh. You say to me, Pastor Bill, you're not going to talk about sin, are you? Yes, I am. Friends, you on the camera, I love you. I truly do. In in Christ's name. I don't even know you. I, you know, take you out on a date or but I, I'm not going to buy you dinner, but I, I, I love you in Jesus' name, and I'm going to tell you the truth. Listen to me. We are all sinners. Little teeny sins, big giant ones, everything in between. We're all sinners. Jesus says, I don't need to dunk you all the way under the water, Peter, but I do want to wash your feet. But it's not the main reason that Jesus did this. But Peter needed to understand He said, not all of you are clean. In verse 11. Who was he referring to? Judas. That's right. Do you not understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am, Jesus says. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So I'll ask the question again. Have you ever washed somebody's feet? Yeah. If you've got a, you've got a child, you wash their little feet. You love them. That's not shocking, is it? You've got a grandchild, wash, wash their little feet. Washing another person's feet. In other words, be nice. Be kind to one another. Love one another. When someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek and say, come on, bring it. <laughs> oh, you're kidding, Pastor Bill. No, I'm not. I'm not very good at that yet. Last time somebody slapped me, I broke them in. Ah, I'm just kidding. I hate that. 
But that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, be nice to each other. Love each other. You guys are going to need each other. I, I can imagine the other stuff that was in the gospel. I mean, every word that happened at these things, it isn't, it's not all written in the Bible. The book of John, at the end of the book, it says if you wrote everything down that Jesus said and did, there'd be so many volumes you couldn't get them in the Library of Congress. You know? Jesus is probably said to these guys, I, I don't know, am I allowed to do this? Kind of add to the story. Jesus probably said to them, you guys are going to need each other. Because they're going to whoop up on you. And friends, you don't think you need people now talking to the camera? If you think you can be alone, first of all, no man is an island. And second of all, Things are getting really crazy out there. Yesterday, we're in one of the nicer restaurants in town. It's only about six in the evening, and they were, they were out of potatoes and rice. How in the world could a significant restaurant at 6 p.m. on Saturday night be out of potatoes and rice? Can you say... Food shortage. Or somebody made a really bad mistake in the purchasing department, and I'm kind of doubting that's the case. So Jesus is telling these guys, you gotta love one another, you gotta be good to one another. Then he talks about in John 13 the betrayal that will happen. You know that he washed Judas's feet. <laughs> Can you imagine that? He washed his feet and he had communion with him. And then he told him, go do what you need to do. And then Jesus talks to the apostles because they're starting to get it. Something's going on here. The master's acting weird. What's he up to? We don't quite get it. Jesus says, look. In John 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If we're not so, I would have told you, and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will take you to myself. And there, that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Why he does it again? Thomas, Thomas, what do you, what? come on, Jesus. Will you stop talking in riddles and just get straight with us here? How straight does it have to be? I am the way, the truth, and the light. Don't be troubled. I got to go away, but I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to get you, and I'm going to take you to where I am. Friends, this is called the rapture of the church. It was popularized around 1890 by a, a preacher or a writer named John Darby. And everybody makes a big deal about it. Oh, it's this, it's that, it's this, it's that. No, it's not. It's that. It says it right there. Jesus, when he's ready, he's going to come and he's going to get us. He's going to take us to where he is. And I can tell you where Jesus is right now. Would you like to know? Who knows where Jesus is? Somebody shout it out. Huh? He's in heaven. Yeah. He's in heaven. You watch it on the camera. Bro, what are you smoking? <laughs> you don't believe in heaven? What do you believe in? Ask him. Friend, I've been studying this for a long time, over 40 years. And I've looked at this from every angle, up, down, sideways, backwards. I, I bet you I've got 10,000 hours of time listening to YouTube and preachers and radio. And that guy. I, no one has been able to convince me yet that this is a fairy tale. And then going on, Jesus promises these guys the Holy Spirit. So he washes their feet. 
He tells Judas, time to go. He didn't, he wasn't upset with him. He said, go ahead, move on. Why, I know what you're going to do. And then he tells the guys where they're going. Amen. And now he promises the Holy Spirit. He says here in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, then you're going to keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's a capital H. That's the Holy Spirit. To be with you for how long? Forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the Lord or the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. It says, you know him. Thomas is sitting there thinking, <laughs> we haven't met anybody named Mr. Helper Jesus. What are you talking about? Here we go again. Peter's. Oi. John's laying on Jesus' lap. He says it right here. He says, You know him. He dwells with you and will be in you. Who's the helper? Who's, who's the Holy Spirit? Who's God? Jesus. God the Father. There it is. There's the Trinity right there. Oh, the Trinity's not in the Bible anywhere. You can't show me the Trinity anywhere in the Bible. I blah, 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 blah. You got friends who said that to you? Family members? Blah, 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 blah. I love to ask him questions like, so um, what part of the Bible have you studied? Oh, I read the whole thing. Really? Well, you missed the book of John. And about 30 other verses that prove the Trinity. Jesus is telling these guys he loves them. And then listen to what he does. He goes on and he says that if the night is, is growing old, he says, he says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Oh, Thomas, what? <laughs> well, you, you're not a vine dresser. Oh, come on, Thomas. Come on, y'all. I'm the branch. You're the, you're the branches. We're going to go out and we're going to bear fruit. Isn't that what we're called to do as Christians? And Jesus says in John 15, verse 7, for the first time, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Uh huh? Whatever you wish. Well, that's a good deal, isn't it? The guy going down the beach stubs his toe on a bottle and he picks it up and he looks at it he blows on it, his super genie comes out some of you have heard this joke super genie says I'm a super genie you can ask for anything in the whole world the universe but you only get one wish the guy says wow nice he says you know I've always wanted to drive to London from New York could you build a bridge over to all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Super Genie says, Ah, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Um, is there anything else you might like? Just, the guy says, You know, I've always wanted to understand my wife. And the Genie says, Do you want one lane or two? <laughs> Stephanie always gets my jokes. Thank you, Stephanie. If you abide in me, whatever you ask. Wait, he says it again. He says it again. Here you go. He, listen here. Verse 16. Jesus says to the guys, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go. And isn't that true? Jesus did choose those guys. You remember in the movies where he finds uh, James and John, and then he finds Nathaniel, and Nathaniel insults him, and you know, he finds, yeah, that's right, Jesus chose them. He says, I chose you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he will give it to you. There it is again. Well, wait, there's more. John 16, he says it again. John 16, in verse 23, he says, 
He says, in that day, he's talking about rejoicing and being filled with joy. He says, in that day, ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And then he looks at the guys and he says, you know what, you guys, until now you have not declared or asked for anything in my name. Not one of them walked up to somebody and said, um, I declare this in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the, the Savior. He, he says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be filled, may be full, may be complete. That's the third time. But wait, there's another one. I mean, Jesus keeps on saying this. Well, there is another one, but I, I guess I didn't highlight it. There's one more time. What is Jesus saying before we come to the communion table? he's saying here ask ask whatever you want in my name and I will give it to you but you got to abide in me and it has to bring glory to the father yeah I'm proud of you guys all of you you're probably thinking I'm going to start picking on people that don't go to church. <laughs> no, I'm not. I've decided I'm not doing that anymore. I do write a little nasty note sometimes. I'm proud of you. You guys are abiding. If you're watching by the camera this morning, and you have, for some reason, you are unable to get up and go to church. You are abiding. If during the week you are helping someone, you're, you're taking some food to a shut-in, you're visiting someone in the hospital, you say, Mr. Bill, I don't have time for that. Yes, you do. Don't tell me you don't have time for that. You, you make time. You make time. Yeah, you're helping. What are you doing? Go back to the beginning of the message. What are you doing when you go help somebody? What are you doing, Pastor Rusty? It has to do with feet. You're washing people's feet. You're here at church. Why are you here at church? Because your middle name is Thomas. <laughs> Stephanie Thomas Thorne. Sherry Thomas. We don't get it. If we all got it, there'd be no reason to come here. And it, there'd be no reason for you to come here and listen to me. Let me tell you all something that is so true. It is so true. I'm, I'm not fibbing one bit. I'm not exaggerating one bit. After the Lord put me down on the ground and, and ground me into fine powder, he said to me, Bill, you got to quit being an idiot because you are going to teach the Bible. I'm like, what? He said to me, Pastor Bill, how do you know that? Did Jesus say that to you? Did he write you a note? Did a prophet speak to you? Let's say it's the Lord. No. Nothing like that. Friends, I woke up the next day after that preacher, Jim, Jim Rogers came to my house and I pulled this out. I had bought this eight years earlier. I have never put it down. I had no interest in the Bible at all. None. And now all I do is think about the Bible. When I'm walking around, I'm writing sermons in my head. I read the Bible every day. Ask Michelle. I cannot wait. Michelle goes to bed early. I kiss her on the forehead. I say, I love you, honey. And I go and I, I, I listen to sermons from people. I read the Bible. I read books. It never, it's never stopped. Why? Because God knew. He knew that I would ask what? 
What the heck are you talking about, Jesus? And if y'all weren't interested, you wouldn't be here. So give yourself a round. Go ahead. It's okay. Well, pat yourself on the back. It's a good thing. All right. What's, what's my point? <laughs> what's my point? Jesus did the last, the Passover meal with these, these people because he knew what they were going to do. He wanted to bless them. He washed their feet. What a sign of humility to, to get on your hands and knees and wash someone's feet. And we've done that at Celebrate Recovery a few times, or at least once. It's, it's pretty interesting. He, he, he wants us to humble ourselves. Jesus wants you to come to church, come to the Passover meal, because he has things he wants you to understand about life. Amen? He wants us to know that, that, that there's, there's a place for us. You're not just going to, as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, become stardust. Can you believe the smartest man in the world believes that we came from stardust? Yes. What kind of destiny is that? He wants you to know that there's a place for you and he's coming to get you. This is good news. He wants your joy, regardless of what's happening in your life. He wants your joy to be complete. Is there anybody in the room right now that's really in a bad mood? Raise your hand. Good, I'm doing my job. Thank you, Jesus. How about you, dear brother? <laughs> yes. You got smiles on your face. Hallelujah. I love it. Oh, Fox News just came up. All right. What's the point? We come here to take communion together to be humble, to learn, to remember what Jesus did without the cross. There is no life. We are the most miserable amongst men, as Paul wrote, without the cross. That's why we come and we gather. So I'm going to ask the praise team to please come back up uh, on the stage. And we're going to sing one more song. And it's a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. yep. As a matter of fact, y'all come take a take one, one of the little cups. These cups, these these are confusing. I, I struggled with them. <laughs> I did. When I first went to a Baptist church and they did the thing, the cup, I'm looking in there, I'm like, where's the wafer? All there is is two, two levels. We opened these for you because they're really hard to open, so we went ahead and opened them for you. Okay. We're going to do one final song. As we do the final song, I'm going to invite you to come and Take time with the Lord. We have an altar over there that needs to get fixed, but it's okay. It won't, you won't, it won't hurt you. I promise. We're gonna sand it, paint it, or something. And, and and just come and enjoy. Take a moment. Take a moment and say, Hey God, will you wash my feet? And then receive the bread and and, and the cup. Say thank you.
Lord, we come to you this morning, and we're thankful, grateful that you live in us, and that you live through us. We're grateful for the fact that we can rely on you, we can worship you, and that you have our, our very best interests at heart. So this morning, as, as we come to take this, this meal, it is representative of the fact that you died for us, you gave your life's blood for us, that your body was broken for us, as we, as we do this, Lord, we confess that we are frail human beings, that we are flesh and blood. And we confess that we often fail you. But we know that your blood, your body, is covered, wash away our sins. So we we rely on that this morning. We put our hope and trust in you. We give you everything that we have, everything that we are. We give it to you. And we ask God this morning that you would allow us to take, take that. We would allow you to live through us and to serve others, to serve your body, to serve those don't know you, but eventually will know you. We give you honor, we give you praise, and as we sing, Lord, we ask God that you be pleased with us as we receive this. This is our blessing, our honor to you. Praise you, Thank you. I 